Today, we are in part of our DNA laboratory. We are going to look at feedback from our users with a pathology postcard. We will talk to Jessica, one of our night staff workers, and we will also present the monthly statistics for legal highs found in our toxicology samples. So, the feedback postcard. As a laboratory, we're working to a quality system under ISO 15189. One problem is always getting feedback from our users. Historically, we've sent out a questionnaire just before a CPA assessment, and the response has usually been very poor. We've hardly been compliant with this aspect. So, coming up to our first UCAS inspection in the next few months, we thought we'd try something new. We have come up with the concept of a postcard. The front of the card gives a feel for who we are and what we do. We clearly state the use of the postcard and encourage suggestions for innovations and comments on things that we do well, as well as pointing to things that we need to improve. And if we look at the reverse of the card, the business side of the card, first of all, takes details of the person submitting the suggestion. There's then plenty of space to detail their observations. We won't be encouraging anonymous postcards and any received will not be entered into our quality system. This now has become a continuous feedback system. We have a controlled document describing the use of the postcard and how it enters into our quality system. The postcard, of course, is just a communication tool. It's not an end in itself. Key to its use is going to be how we distribute it and then what we do with the cards when they come back. We need to take appropriate action on the comments that come in uh, around the laboratory. Initially, we have sent the postcard out to 140 GP practices. This card will over time be sent out to all of our service users in the hospital and out in the community. Our staff and others that work with us will have the card available as well. So, for example, transport drivers can have some in their vans to our hand to people uh, when they comment on our service. We may even put it in our call centre so we can appropriately uh, gather feedback from people who phone us up. Now, let's take a walk down the corridor to our essential service laboratory and talk to Jessica, one of our night staff workers. Hi Jessica, I see that you've made the front cover of ACB News. How did that happen? Well, it just came about when I had a portfolio review with my training officer and head of department and I just agreed to writing it. Okay. And um, what's your degree in? Well, um, both my MSc and uh, BSc is in biomedical science. So, how did you find out about bank work at our trust? Well, I was looking around for volunteer work after I'd finished my studies and I came across um, the laboratory manager and he suggested bank work, so I just went for it. Oh, great. Um, what were your initial thoughts when you were selected to be trained as an AFC Band 4 out of hours worker? Well, I was quite worried about security and whether I'll be able to um, fulfil the responsibilities of the role, but I was determined to gain that experience, so... Great. Can you briefly describe to me what your role entails? Well, processing every urgent biochemistry sample, answering bleeps and just um, any add-on requests or anything and speaking to doctors. Has this nocturnal lifestyle impacted on your home and social life? <laughs> oh, where should I begin? Um, being quite a social person, um, it's quite difficult to adjust to this sort of lifestyle because you don't get to see your friends and family as often as you used to. Sure. Um, can you give me an example of a quiet night and not so quiet night? Well, a quiet night would be when everything's running smoothly, all the analysers are working and all the results are going across um, you know, just normally. But not so quiet night would be with something malfunctions and then yeah. you just have to try and keep on top of the work um, and try and answer all the bleeps and just, yeah, trying to get everything... Everything's going wrong. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> um, what would you say that you've learnt from this experience? Well, just how to stay calm during those times and um, trying to get through a night, even though it's busy, you know, just staying calm and being organised. Yeah. Um, from your experience, is there anything that you would like to suggest or recommend to labs that they could take forward? Um, well, I'd like to suggest that labs should be more understanding how to prepare for um, shift work and um, how, they should, how they can cope with it rather than just being, like, going straight into it and trying to adjust. Yeah, sure. Finally, it's my last question. What are your plans for the future? 
Well, when I wrote this article, I was actively looking for a band type uh, BMS trainee position, but fortunately I've managed to secure a position. So oh, that's great. Congratulations that. on that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for taking the time out to share your experiences with us, Jessica. Thank you very much. Jonathan, let's end with the monthly statistics for legal highs. OK, fresh from our toxicology laboratory. First of all, the classic drugs of abuse for January 2015. Out of a total of 1,930 urine samples received, heroin, 306 positive. And you, you can pause the video and look at the rest uh, in your own time. If we look now then at the legal highs for January, 1,930 samples again, and we see the most uh, outstanding statistic is a record number of positive adamantal cannabinoids, 54 positive for the month of January. These are the substances that are added to the smoking products that were sold so easily on our high streets in the UK at the present time. 